Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. If you were to be asked, how would you describe Messiah? We're speaking of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Lion from the tribe of Judah. But do you realize when most people are asked to describe him and not use religious words or spiritual words, but simply adjectives that we would use to describe other people, you know what the most frequent response is? The word gentle. Well, today, in our study from the book of Matthew, we're going to see Messiah, and he's anything but gentle. And in fact, when Messiah returns at the end of this age to establish his kingdom, he is not coming, and this is certainly supported in the book of Revelation, he is not coming in a gentle way, but he is coming in a most intense way. Why? Because he is passionate about the will of God. So you and I, we need to ask ourselves a very important question. Am I passionate? Am I intense? Am I truly committed to the things of God? Because if you're not, you are not going to be found faithful when the Son of Man returns. And perhaps that's one of the reasons that he himself asks, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? My hope is, and the purpose of such studies, is that we would be encouraged, trained, in order to be found faithful. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 21. The book of Matthew, chapter 21. Now, we have seen that Yeshua has, has left the Galilee. He is in Judea, that is. He has come to the regions around, and now he's in Jerusalem. In fact, we're going to see as our scripture opens up that he enters in to the temple. And I want you to pay very close attention to what he does and what he says. So once more, Matthew 21, and we're going to begin in verse 12. We read, and Yeshua entered into, and pay close attention, not just the temple, but it says the temple of God. The very place where the presence of God in a unique, in a special, in a special way, God's presence was in that location. And now his only begotten son, the one that was sent into the world to bring about his will. He's in that same place and notice his behavior. He didn't come to teach. He came to set things in order. And what we see here is once more, he is intense, he is passionate, he's committed to set things in order. And when you approach him humbly, when you approach him committed and passionate for God's order to be the order of your life, he is going to move. He is going to respond. And what he does here is testimony to that. This wasn't popular. Most of the people did not like it, but we're going to see. There's an outcome when God's order is embraced. Furthermore, when God's order is enacted, and there are going to be times when God is calling you 
to be the one who in acts does behaves in a way that the will of God is maintained. Look again. Yeshua entered into the temple of God and he cast out all, all the ones who were selling and buying in the temple. And the tables of the money changers he overturned. Also, the seats of the ones who were selling doves. And he said to them, notice verse 13, so frequently when Messiah spoke, he spoke scripture. And I'm not talking about New Testament scripture that's recorded, but what was written in the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh. And he quotes a scripture, look at what it says, middle of verse 13. It is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. That's what he wants. He wants this location where the presence of God in a unique way dwells there. He wants people to know that they can come and experience God. But notice what had happened. There was buying and selling, the changing of of money. It was a place of business, of commerce, not of spiritual things. And therefore, he acted in a most unusual way and anything but gentle. What does he do? He cast out, he threw out physically those who were selling and buying in the temple. And the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves and pigeons, he overturned. And he spoke with authority. What authority? The authority of his heavenly father. What it says in the word of God, my house is a house of prayer and it shall be called thus. But you have made it a den of thieves. Now, not only were people using spiritual truth for financial gain, but they were doing so. How? In a dishonest way. You say, well, how do you know that? Because he speaks of them and says to the ones who were doing business there that you had made it a den of thieves. They were stealing in the name of God. And we see that Yeshua was not going to tolerate this. And when he comes again, there are going to be many people. Paul talks about this, for example, in 2 Corinthians When he says the majority, the most, they peddle. That is, they've turned into business the word of God. But Paul says in sincerity, in that which is transparent, he says, we share the word of God. Paul was compassionate, but he was passionate for the word of God. And he was committed to the truth of God. And where did he receive that? From his Lord and Savior. We see that Messiah, he speaks and he says, you have made my house, the house of my heavenly father, which is called a house of prayer. And if we read the whole citation for many nations, all nations, he says, you have made it into a den of, of thieves verse 14 and notice the response after he did this it says and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them now this is important now many people if you look at many commentators they will take you to second samuel chapter 5 and verse 8 and it says that 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 those who are blind and lame ought not be in the temple. But here's the problem. Most people who quote this, they don't do diligent study. Why? Because when David said this, it was not about those who were physically blind and unable to walk. But he said that in regard to those who were bringing idols, idols that the scripture says, 
They can't see, although they have eyes. They can't walk, although they have feet. They are powerless. So he was speaking about idols not being allowed in the place of worship. This is something totally different. What we see here is Yeshua. After he set things in order, those who were blind and lame, they came in and they wanted to pray. And what was the outcome of their prayer? God moved mightily. How? Just what it says right here. And he healed them, verse 15. But in contrast to this great miracle, it says, but the high priests and the scribes seeing, and the word here is a word for being marveled, and it's the things that cause one to be marveled. And it's speaking about those miracles that he just did with the blind and the lame. They saw that, but instead of recognizing who he is, this is a messianic prophecy. Healing the blind and the lame, that's what Isaiah says Messiah is going to do. But instead of them paying attention to Scripture and Scripture being fulfilled before them, recognizing that, what did they do? Look again. Seeing, and we're speaking about the high priest and the scribe, seeing the, the miracles which he did. And the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna, that is Hoshana, to the son of David, meaning save us, please, O son of David, which is a term, we've talked about this, for Messiah. When they saw these things and heard these things, notice what the scripture says at the end of verse 15, they became angry, indignant. They were not pleased. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that God that he was pleased when these individuals who were blind and unable to walk in such a circumstance, difficulty, do you think God was pleased? I know he was. How? Because it was the power of God through the Son of God that brought about these marvelous things. Now, what's interesting, as I said, the biblical word has to do with marveling at something. And that should literally cause a person to think, to give consideration, but they didn't. They were only concerned about their objective. Now, verse 16. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? But Yeshua, he says to them, yes. And have you not read? Again, what's he going to do? He's going to quote scripture. Everything that he said, everything that he did was based upon scriptural truth. He says, have you never read that from the mouths of babes, infants, and those who are nursing, that, that you, and it's a quote of scripture concerning God, that you have prepared praise. Now, this word, for preparing praise, it's in the, the middle, which can be understood as the reflexive, meaning you have prepared praise, and the praise is for him, for himself. So some Bibles translate it and really get to the heart of it that God, he has prepared praise for himself. And how has he done that? By having his will fulfilled. So praise coming from the will of God, Scripture being fulfilled. Look at verse 17. And he left them and went out outside. Now here again, most Bibles don't pick up on this. But when we look at literally the text, and I'm translating from the Greek, it says here when we look, he went outside, outside. That word appears twice. Why? The first time as a prefix to the verb. The second time it stands alone. It's redundant, but it shows. The scripture is teaching in an awkward way, but this awkwardness has revelation. 
that he wanted nothing to do with this place, with them, these corrupt leaders that would not recognize the movement of God in their midst. So leaving them, he went out outside the city to Bethany, that is Bet Anya, and he, he stayed there. Verse 18. Now we're coming up on one of my favorite scriptures. But early in the morning, he, he returned into the city, and he was hungry. And seen one fig tree on the way. Now, we have seen many times in our study of Matthew that term, on the way. And this is the way of God to bring about the will of God, the purposes of God, the outcome of God. Ultimately, this phrase has kingdom implications. So when we see this, we need to think this passage now, how he has left the temple area, gone outside, outside the city into the Mount of Olives to that place called Bet Ani or Bet Anya, house of afflicted ones. And there he spent the night. And now look again, but early in the morning, he returned to the city and he was hungry. And that important phrase, and behold, whenever that happens, it's something exciting, something significant is about to happen. And behold, one fig tree on the way. He came to it, but nothing he found on it except leaves only. Now, in another scripture, it says, but it wasn't the season for figs, for it to produce figs says who see we need to remember this scripture comes to us within a kingdom context and when you read about trees in the kingdom of God in the new Jerusalem those trees in the kingdom of God that holy city that new Jerusalem these trees are going to give fruit 12 times a year every month meaning this there's always harvest time. This speaks about God's kingdom expectations. What are they? That we would be fruitful when? Always. So this fig tree, it is not behaving as a kingdom tree, but as a tree that is subjected to this world. Well, let me tell you, when you subject yourselves to the things of this world, you're not going to be producing fruit. This was the problem of the leadership. Those who were selling and buying in the temple, they were doing what the world does. Business. Make some money. And if you have to cheat a little bit, well, everyone does that. That's the way of the world. But hear this. It is not the way of God. It does not reflect the righteousness, the character of God. And here again, is, is this going to be an example of Messiah, the gentle Savior? It is not. It is going to be the one who is passionate about the kingdom outcome, righteousness, holiness, justice. So he comes to this, this fig tree, and it says, look at verse 19, but he found nothing, literally nothing he found on it except leaves only and he says to it no longer from you fruit where they'll be forever so he says upon you O fig tree there will never ever be again fruit forever now that's pretty intense why because he is expecting a kingdom activity, not things subjected to the things of the world. 
So he says this to this fig tree. And notice what happened? Middle of verse 19. And it was dried up. Just didn't dry up on its own, but it was made to dry up immediately. What was this fig tree? Verse 20. The disciples seen, they were amazed. And they were saying, how so quickly does the fig tree be made dry? Not what? It couldn't be in a natural way. Here's the message for us. When we are under his authority, when we are living under his anointing, the anointing of the Spirit of God, we're going to find that we are not going to behave naturally, but supernaturally. We're going to do according to the will of God. That's what the message is. Eventually, this tree produced no fruit, but it did ultimately do the will of God. And what was that? When he judged it, when he condemned it, it experienced the condemnation from the Lord. It was dried up immediately. And once again, verse 20, and seeing this, the disciples, they were amazed, saying, how so quickly was this fig tree dried up? Verse 21. But Yeshua, in contrast to their thoughts, he's going to answer the question. But Yeshua answered, he said to them, Amen, that is truly Truly, I say to you, if you have faith. Now, remember, faith is not what you believe. Faith is when you believe specifically the truth. And where is the truth found? The truth is found only in this book, in Scripture, the Holy Bible. The Holy Bible, why do we call it a Holy Bible? Bible simply means book, but holy means set apart for the things of God. If I want to be someone that is committed to the things of God, I need to read this book. Those who are not committed to the things of God, this book is not going to be all that much of an interest to them. I was hearing a a few weeks ago, someone speaking, and it was amazing to me that this individual, he was speaking about good news the gospel. And when he came to truth, he basically said, you know, the problem today is that we all have different views of what is truth. So let's just set it aside because we want to preserve unity. What a deceiver. When we set aside truth, there's not going to be unity. There's going to be chaos. The only way that we can have unity is when we embrace the truth. And when people don't, This is a sign that one of two things. They need to be discipled and loved and grown and mature to receive the truth, maybe get saved, or it's a sign that they are the rebels. They are against the things of God, and they ought not be in our congregation, in our fellowship. Eventually, as John says, they will go out from us because they never belong to us. So pay attention here. He says, truly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, don't doubt this book. Do not doubt the truth of God. When you doubt, you know what you're doing? You are inviting the enemy to oppress you, to deceive you, to take authority over your thoughts And if that happens, he'll have authority over your actions, your deeds as well. And too many people doubt the word of God. This book is true. This book was inspired perfectly by the Holy Spirit. It is inspired fully without errors from God himself. So he says, do not doubt. Verse verse. 21, he says, but not only the, and the word here, the, is in relationship to the miracle. Not only the miracle 
of the fig tree you will do, but also to this mountain you will say. Now, we talked about this expression a few weeks ago. And we mentioned that the mountain at heart of this passage is the Mount of Olives. Why the Mount of Olives? It is uniquely related to the ministry of Messiah. And we know when Messiah comes the second time to set up his kingdom, when his feet, and I'm speaking about Zechariah chapter 14, when his feet touches the Mount of Olives, you know what's going to happen? That mountain is going to be split in two. One is going to, inside is going to go into the sea, what is called the Dead Sea, and the other one into the Mediterranean. And when that happens, what's going to be the outcome? The kingdom of God. So he says, if you don't doubt, but rather you believe, not just uh, cursing a fig tree you will do, but also you shall say to this mountain, be lifted up and cast into the sea, and it will be done, meaning it's faith, commitment, passion, to the truth of God that is going to bring about the kingdom of God. One more verse and we'll be done. Look at verse 22. And all what you ask in prayer. Now, let me ask you a question. Hopefully, you're asking for the will of God. You're not asking things, are you, that are in conflict with God's will. That would be a foolish thing to do. So when he says, all that you ask, If you're operating in faith that is under the truth of God, you're going to be in agreement with God. And therefore, he says, all what you ask in prayer, be believing. Don't put a doubt on it. Be believing. And what's going to be the outcome? And you will receive. God will move mountains in order that his will is realized in your life, that you become a partaker of the purposes, the promises of God. But it's not going to happen until you become someone who is passionate, committed, intense about the things of God. And if you're not, that is a great area for your prayer. Pray to be passionate about the purposes of God. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.